Amen. So we're turning the page a bit. Looking at the Holy Spirit's work in our life. As we walk through Romans 8 together. And we're going to enjoy the great and glorious truth. And I have the privilege of reading to you from chapter 8. Verses 18 through 27, which you can find on page 1,118 in our pew Bibles. And I ask that you please stand for the reading of God's Word. Consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation itself was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself would be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And God bless the reading of His word to your soul. What an awesome, awesome text. Amen. And I just, um, as I'm listening to our brother read it, I'm like, all the words there that describe God's people. Amen. It's church. Church. Groaning. Amen. Um, can't wait to talk about that. Groaning. Um, patient. Uh, eagerly awaiting something. Um, persevering. So those are words that describe each and every one of you, each and every one of us, if we're true believers in Christ. Groaning. Eagerly awaiting. Persevering. What was the other one I said? Hey, oh, patient. There was other words in there as well, but we're continuing looking at this uh, this Holy Spirit, Christ in us, the hope of glory. We're looking at it in the context of Romans 8 about walking in the Spirit, which is walking and living in the Spirit, it looked like. And um, I think just about everybody here in the building this morning knows the answer to this question that the sermon, uh, the title of the message is. What is wrong with the world today, and why is there so much suffering? Um, think to myself, what's wrong with the world today? Sin. Amen. Right? That's the issue. The central idea here is a final and complete freedom. This is why there's groaning. A final and complete freedom from the corruption and defilement of sin awaits those who are in Christ Jesus. Remember, 
this whole best series of messages in Roman 8 is in light of there is now now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and all the beautiful truths and principles that preceded in Romans 8 after that statement are applying and, and today is uh, like that as well. Final and complete freedom from the defilement of sin, the corruption of sin erase those who are in Christ Jesus, but until then, creation groans from the defilement of sin. True believers groan from the defilement of sin. And the Holy Spirit groans from the defilement of sin. So Lord Jesus, what a... Yeah, Romans 8 is just such a glorious, glorious chapter in the Word. And these verses are just uh, jumping out at us here this morning, Lord. We pray that we won't miss any of it. Pray, Lord, that uh, the words that come out of my mouth will exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and what He has done and what He is doing and setting us free from the corruption and defilement of sin. We pray, Lord, that we will be so touched and moved by the reality of the truth of what is happening in our world today, what is happening in our own hearts and lives, all because we belong to you. Lord, that we will just be so changed and transformed and continue to be changed and transformed by you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. A final and complete freedom from the defilement, the corruption of sin, waits those who are in Christ Jesus. Until then, look at verse 18. Creation groans. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth until now. Wow. Look at verse 18 again. Is that true or not? The answer is, I'm going to take this off. It's starting to make some feedback. Yes, it is true. I consider that the sufferings, Paul is saying this, right? Paul is saying, I consider that the sufferings of this present world are not to be compared with something not to be compared with the glory that awaits us. He's, the word consider or reckon refers to a serious, deliberate consideration on the part of the apostle when he's thinking about this. And actually, you could say, he's saying, I am fully convinced of this. Certainly fully convinced of it while writing in a Roman prison epistles that he wrote were written there. And so what was Paul, and see we Lord help us to get a grasp on this for ourselves, of what was Paul fully convinced of? It says he was fully convinced that the sufferings, the trials, the tribulations, the difficulties, the trauma and drama that he faced in his life is not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed in us. It's, the illustration has been made. It's like, you know, the weight of it compared to a uh, weight in the like, feathers. Like He said that in 2 Corinthians about our light momentary affliction. When we're in the middle of it, it doesn't feel light or momentary, but when compared with what awaits us, Eternity in his presence, it is a light weight in comparison to that. He says here, for the anxious longings of creation waits for the revealing of the sons of God. And we see 
in these other next verses that the whole creation is groaning because of a defilement of sin, because of the corruption of sin. That began there in the garden, and I'll read those verses in a minute. So, in light of creation groaning, the whole world groaning, and we see the, you know, it was a long time ago, but we see planes going into towers, blowing up towers and killing people. We see, you know, wars and rumors of wars, and we see um, the effects of creation groaning. Why does this happen? We know the answer of why this happens. Because of the corruption and defilement of sin in the hearts of people who carry out their sinful desires. So if creation is groaning, here, this is an important principle for us to remember. And sometimes, you know, we, we say, why, you know, why is this happening to me? You know, and sometimes we're like, where is God in the midst of it? So just try to remember, beloved, don't think that when you suffer, it has to do necessarily with you personally or me personally. All creation is growing as part of the defilement of sin, the corruption of sin, and it's well beyond even our personal situation. And we live in a world that's broken, it's fallen, because of what we're going to remind ourselves here in a minute in uh, Genesis 3, 17 through 19. That wasn't how it was until sin entered into the world. And so now we have, all you got to do is look in the mirror. Not if you're really young, but you get to be a certain age and you look in the mirror and you can see the effect of creation going and you can see the effects of sin as our bodies deteriorate and then there's, you know, issues, health issues and then there's walkers and wheelchairs and Alzheimer's and dementia and cancer and heart disease and all the things that occur, occur as a result of the corruption of sin. Look at verse 20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, because of him who subjected it in hope. So the whole creation is groaning. Yet even in the midst of the groaning, and in the midst of the defilement of sin, there's still hope. Amen. You already got those little tastes of hope. You go down, you go down in the, where the what do you call that? Where we go in, where Fellowship Hall is, that little walkway. I was over there. It's usually the way I come in, or sometimes I come in the back. But I'm looking, and there's hope. There's hope. There's spring. There's those buds that are there already. Of uh, the daffodils that are gonna come up. Okay. Um, even in the midst of the creation groaning, there's the beauty uh, and the splendor. And there's hope. It says in here, even though creation groans is subjected uh, in futility, not willingly, but it, but there's hope, right? There is hope. There's no hope when his life ends and a person dies not being in Christ Jesus. We'll talk more about that later. But look at verse 20 for the creation. I read verse 20. I want to read Genesis 3 here. Uh, verses 17 through 19. When Adam and Eve, and we, we're, we're so familiar with Genesis 3, he's going to pick up 17 through 19. When Adam and Eve sinned by disobeying God's commandments, we know not only mankind, but also the earth and the whole rest of the world was cursed, corrupted, and subject to fertility at the hand of God. But in the midst of that, as I said, we still see hope. Look at Genesis 3, 17 through 19. Then to Adam... He said, because you listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you'll eat of it all the days of your life. So we know that's why work is a chore and a burden. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. Not like that before the entrance of sin. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, 
you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. I should have started <laughs> at least in verse 14 and 15. The Lord said to the serpent, Because you've done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle and all the other beasts of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And there's the first gospel presentation there, verse 15. He will bruise you on the head, and you will bruise, and you will bruise him on the heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth, and praying you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. So it's creation grows, creation is subject to fertility, yet in hope, in spite of the curse, there is still much benefits of beauty and hope that we see. Verse 22 says, for the, 22 says, for we know that the whole creation grows and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. So the groaning and the sufferings of the defilement of sin will one day cease when he says, I make all things new. New heavens, new earth. God will deliver it from corruption and futility. But in the meantime, look at the words that are used to describe creation. Verse 18 says suffering. Verse 20 says futility. Verse 21 says slavery. Verse 21 says, corruption. Verse 22 says, pain. Now, aren't you glad? Thank God it's not all that. It is that. But there's spring, and there's sunrise, and there's sunset, and there's beautiful walks along the beach and the ocean, and seeing the beauty of creation. There's being married and giving in marriage. There's families. There's, there's single families. There's, there's life. There's... There's beauty, there's uh, hope, but only if you know Jesus Christ can you really have that hope. So all of creation groans for the final freedom from the coming corrupt, from the corruption and defilement of sin. Creation groans. Now look who else groans in verse 23. Now there's a difference between groaning and murmuring. of the Israelites in the desert. That's different. There's, there's the complaining over your lot in life versus groaning after what believers are supposed to groan after what it says here in verse 23. Look at verse 23. As believers groan, as creation groans, believers groan from a defilement of sin. Not just the defilement of sin out here in the world, but the defilement still of the remnant of sin within, that is really something to increase, increasingly groan about and have it be affecting us in how we live. All right, verse 23. And not only this, but we also ourselves. So here, you got the first, you're a believer in Jesus Christ, really, and you're born again, through a living hope of the resurrection from Jesus Christ from the dead, you have, we have something. We have the first fruits of the Spirit. We have the first fruits of eternity forever in the presence of Christ. We have the Holy Spirit, which is what Romans 8 speaks a lot about. And we've talked about this in the context of some of the other messages in this series. We know the Holy Spirit is a person. And we know the Holy Spirit from the Scripture says, it's a down payment. He, I said it, He is a down payment on eternity. He is a down, and the, the He is the, it's the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ when He said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We have the first fruits of that that we enjoy now. And it's a down payment on 
eternity with Christ. It's like you have Christ's presence with you now, and it's just to be ever, ever increasing throughout all of eternity. The effect that he has on us is to be ever increasing now and throughout all eternity. The first fruits of the Spirit. So we ourselves, even, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves. So you see the beauty and the majesty of this verse. Not only does creation groan, true believers groan. But we groan over something different. We're supposed to groan. We groan of, we're supposed to groan after something different. Yeah, so the reason why we are to groan is because we have experienced the first fruits or the foretaste of the glory to come. The classic example of someone groaning, we've read it countless times, is in the chapter right here before this. We'll read that in a minute where Paul is groaning over something. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves. This groaning speaks of a condition that is painful. And I'm not talking about, the, we're not talking about here the circumstances of life that are painful. They are painful. We don't, we don't blighten it. We don't, you know, shish it aside. We're a church. We're a body of believers. When one part, one of the members suffers, we all suffer with that person. And Brother John and I have an open heart and an open door policy when one of our brothers and sisters in Christ is suffering or dealing with the trials and tribulations and trauma and difficulty of life. And we have the privilege of we have the privilege of them coming to us. I'm laughing because it is a privilege when someone comes to us and says, hey, this is such as going on, you know, help me with this. Pray with me. Give me the biblical perspective over this. And um, that's why it's, that's what makes a church, part of what makes a church. So it's a blessing when we can come alongside a brother or sister in Christ. Other times I hear, well, I don't want to bother you. You guys are just too busy. Focus there is in the wrong place. I mean, it might sound nice, and but the, but the focus is just the focus is a little inward, even in that statement. And so again, we look at it as a blessing, we look at it as a privilege, and we don't downplay or soften. I mean, or you know, don't we just get over it? type of deal. We know there's pain, suffering, and sorrow in this world. And, um, but that's not the kind of groaning Paul's talking about here in this verse of the believers groaning. Okay? This groaning again speaks of something painful, unsatisfying, sorrowful, a cry for deliverance, for really a torturing experience. And the torturing experience that Paul is talking about is what he had happened and what he felt in Romans chapter 7, verses 18 through 20, and verses 24 through 25. And you think about, and I think about my groanings. My groanings, in that sense, aren't groanings. They're complaining over situations or circumstances or difficulties. All right, let's, let's listen to the Apostle Paul's groans. And then you and I think about what we do we groan like this. Paul groans over the sin that he still sees in his life, the defilement from sin that he still sees in his life, the corruption from sin that he still sees in his life, not the sin of everybody around him, but sin within. Right? For I know, he says, and we've read this so many times, I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of good is not. Groan. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. Do not want. That's groaning over the defilement of sin and the corruption of sin 
that still exists in the person, even though they're saved, but they're being changed, and they're being transformed in this, into the image and likeness of Christ, and that gives them great, gives us great hope. He said, but I'm not, but I'm doing the very thing I do not want. Groan. He goes, I know, I know, I know, I, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Sinful nature, sinful flesh dwells in us. At the same time, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Christ's Spirit in dwells us. Triumph here. What wretched man that I am, who will set me free? We're talking about being set free from the defilement of sin, the corruption of sin. Who will set me free from this body of death? And there's freedom in the present to be experienced through sanctification, and there's freedom from it to be accomplished forever in glory and glorification. Thanks be to God. It's only through Christ. That's why the next chapter says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thanks be to God, verse 25, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. So again, you know, we have to, we have to think about, as I've been thinking about all week, you know, what do I, do I groan like this? See, if we groan like this, then there's some action steps that we take that we'll get to here, Okay. That's why it's an absolute hypocrisy and an absolute tragedy when a person who is professing or saying that they're a disciple and follower of Christ, that they decided to follow Jesus. Yes, I did that. I did that. I said that prayer. Somebody led me in this prayer. And we're not against praying with someone to receive Christ, but someone led me in this prayer and pronounced me saved. And there's no following in obedience to the Lord. And you get people around them telling them they're still saved. Every true believer, when confronted with their sin, like Paul was here, agonizes over it over the appalling manifestations of it, the consequences of it in their own life, and they confess it, and they repent of it, that's a mark of a true believer. Instead of the ones that will be, and none of those who cry out to me and say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven, Matthew 7, right? We quote that one. Every true believer, again, is agonizes over the sin. Do you find yourselves with this kind of groanings going on in your life? If you do, that's good. If we do, that's good. There's great hope there. That's how you know you're the Lord's. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4, Paul says, For indeed, while we are in this tent, that's this body, we groan. Being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. That's the life of the true believer, right? That's the life of being sanctified. It's being swallowed up more and more by the life and the presence of Christ. We received all of Christ, and we received all of Him when we were born again, when we were saved, we're not talking about a second blessing, we're not talking about adding something on, we, we've received him, but there's this being swallowed up, there's this, there's this being filled with the Spirit, continually, swallowed up by the life of Christ, so that his life affects you and I more and more in the midst of the difficulties that we deal with. So, what would our life look like and what would my life look like and what would our life look like if we had more of this kind of groanings like Paul is talking about here? Groaning over the effect of sin in their life. 
Even we ourselves, verse 23 says, groan. Waiting eagerly, so while we're groaning, we're not, you know, wallowing around and beating ourselves up and, you know, saying, oh, poor me, poor me, poor me, 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 I, 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 I. No, instead we're eagerly awaiting our adoption as sons, the, the redemption of our body, the, the fullness of that. Waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons. Full measure of that. Meaning the best is yet to come. So, look, I, I get it. We're, we were made of flesh and blood. What do you find yourself mainly waiting for in this life or groaning for in this life? You grow more for suffering to end. Or let's move toward growing more for final freedom from the defilement and corruption of sin, our sin, our own sin. Verse 24 says, For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he already sees? So we have this hope, we have this living hope, but if we hope for what we do not see, what do we do? We read earlier about eagerly awaiting our adoption. You know, eagerly awaiting, you know, implies, you know, uh, taking, that, taking advantage of the means and the measures of grace that he has given to us to grow deeper in our relationship with him. Paul says, you know, you part of Peter said in 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory forever and ever. But grow. And you know, that implies you know, activity you know, on our part to grow in that measure. So eagerly awaiting, and then in verse 25 says, but if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we eagerly wait for it. So the life of the believer, the life of the true believer, true believers grow from the defilement of sin and the corruption of sin in their life, true believers eagerly awaiting the adoption of their full measure of their adoption. They're adopted, they're saved, and they're persevering. Listen to Matthew 24, verse 10. you got a contrast between persevering and not persevering. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. That's not persevering. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Mm -hmm. Why? Because lawless is increased, most people's love will grow cold. That's why it says, remember your first love. Don't forsake your first love. So, you know, you examine yourself, you know, well, you know what, my, my love for the Lord is growing cold. Call the elders. Speak to the elders. Have them come. You'll never, it's not a no, it's a no judgment zone when you come and speak with us. There'll be encouragement. There'll be resources. There'll be, read this, study this, look, look at these verses. Let's pray. There'll be help. But when people's love grows cold, you know what they do? Professing believers, if they really truly are believers, you know what they do when their love grows cold? They flee. They go in the other direction. And we say to someone like that, or the Bible, Christ says to someone like that, says to us ourselves, Come, come to me. Come, it's always come. Come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Come to me. Persevere. Keep going. Because verse 13 says, But the one who endures or perseveres to the end will be saved. And verse 14 says, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the whole in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Then the end will come. So a final and complete freedom from the corruption and defilement of sin 
awaits us. Until then, creation groans from the defilement of sin. True believers groan from the defilement of sin. And this next one is real shorter explanation than the other first two. The Holy Spirit groans from the defilement of sin. The Holy so you groan, I groan from a defilement of sin and the corruption of sin. And the Holy Spirit, Christ's presence in us, our hope of glory, groans also. That's why it says, don't grieve. Don't grieve. The Holy Spirit, for whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. We ought to, in the right way, take more seriously our grieving. We've got, we got to look at Ephesians 4 for that. The Holy Spirit. All right, look at uh, verse 26 and 27, back in Romans 8. In the same way, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. The Comforter. He said, I will be with you always. He said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to be with you. He helps us in our weaknesses, for we don't even know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit Himself intercedes, there's the groaning, intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So we're not left alone in our suffering in the effects of creation groaning around us and bodies deteriorating and death occurring and all the stuff. That we're not left alone in the midst of that. And we're not left alone in our own groanings. The Holy Spirit intercedes and he searches the hearts and knows the mind of the the spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So you see the true help that we have in the midst of our groanings over the defilement of sin in our lives and the Holy Spirit. And, and, and you know again it, it's it's the Holy Spirit it's Christ's presence within us in that sense groaning and grieved over our sin. The Holy Spirit praying for us and interceding for us. Just that thought is just marvelous. So a final and complete freedom from the corruption and the final of sin awaits those who are in Christ Jesus. So we'll apply it a couple more different ways here. What do we do in the midst of that? But in the midst of it, what do we do? We need to hope for the right things. Because we're talking about hope here again. We need to hope for the right things while creation is growing. First John 3, 2 through 3. Beloved. Now we are children of God. And it has not appeared as yet what we will be. You're not finished yet. We're being changed. We're being transformed. This is a process. We have the means of grace. We have the fellowship of the church. We have the, the encouragement of one another. And we know that when he appears, we will be like him. That's that transformation, Romans 12. Because we will see him as he is. Now listen to verse 3. The person who has this hope, the person who is the true believer... The person who is the true child of God, everyone who has this hope. So do you have this hope? It says, if you have this hope like fixed on you, it's like, it's like, you know, over you. It's like over you. You have this hope fixed on you. You're his, you belong to him. Everyone who has this hope fixed on him is doing something in the present in light of their groanings over the defilement of the sin in their life. What they're doing presently with this hope fixed on him. They pure, he purifies himself just as he is pure. That's the sanctification. That's the going after Christ. That's the crying out to him. That's the repenting. That's the that's that dealing with the idols of our heart that are driving our sinful behavior. I'm looking at this book that I recently found again. And I was looking at it. Man, I want to read this again. For myself, it's called Idols of the Heart by Elise Fitzpatrick. We did a study on this oh, years ago. Learning to, learning to long for God alone. And it deals with our sin. It deals with the corruption of our sin, the defilement of our sin, 
and the idols of our heart that are driving our sinful behavior. The person who has this hope fixed on him is purifying themselves just as he is pure. And you, use, you take resources like that. You take the Word of God and you search it and you apply it to your life if you got this hope fixed on you. Philippians 3, 20 through 21. Let's read that. In light of what we are to do, our citizenship is in heaven, for which we eagerly await. Oh, there we are again. Eagerly, eagerly awaiting, not passive, when there's an opportunity to join with the brothers and sisters in Christ in worship, we're eagerly after that, or Bible study, or prayer, or personal prayer, or corporate prayer. Eat where I, we're there. Because we're eagerly awaiting this. We're in hot pursuit of Christ, wanting to be changed and transformed. And to do that, sometimes you gotta, we got to turn away from the things of the world, right? Eagerly awaiting a Savior. And what? What would a, what does a church look like that's eagerly, a body, a body of believers, eagerly awaiting their Savior, it's not a passive deal, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity to the body of His glory by the exertion of the power of His, by the exertion of His power that He, that He has even subject all things to Himself. 2 Peter 3, verse 13. Hoping for the right things while creation is groaning and while we ourselves are groaning. 2 Peter 3, 13 says, But according to his promise, we're looking for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Not a passive endeavor. So what makes you groan? What makes me groan? Here's another answer from the scripture. Here's another answer from the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Start with verse 16. Don't lose heart, therefore. Do not lose heart. But though our outward man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. In the midst of the suffering, while we are looked not at things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And Matthew 5, 6 fits here <laughs> so well. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. There's groaning in that verse. Blessed are those who groan for greater Christ-likeness. Hunger and thirst. Can you imagine what your life and my life would look like if we really hungered and thirsted for righteousness? For, for uh, it would be freeing. Then we would know the truth, and the truth would set us free. All true believers ought to have a hunger and thirst for righteousness that even makes us groan. You know, what, what are our hungers? What are our spiritual hungers? What are our groanings? Which ones are the loudest in your life? And you'll satisfy them, and I'll satisfy them with a whole bunch of different idols of my heart. I'll try to satisfy those desires with idolatry, addiction, a whole bunch of stuff. How do we satisfy them in obedience or disobedience to God? And the last part here for application, and then we're going to 
wrap up. There may be somebody sitting here, there may be somebody watching this. Will you groan for all eternity? Wow. Weeping, groaning. Gnashing of teeth, groaning. In utter despair and darkness, alone. How many fools have said, oh yeah, I don't care, when I go to heaven, there's going to be a great big party, I'm just going to hang out with all my guys and girls and every sinful debauchery that I've enjoyed in this life. We're just going to have a big party up there. No, you will be alone. And you'll remember a moment like this, maybe where you've heard the gospel clearly presented to you and you walked away in the hardness of your heart unregenerate, unsaved, with no repentance. You'll groan. You'll groan for all eternity. Revelation 21 says this, 6 says, Then he said to me, It is written, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water, life, water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things. Overcomes what? The satisfaction and the hungers and the thirst that they have inside. And they're overcoming their desires, their flesh, their, their idols, their, their addict, their, their, all their stuff. They're overcoming it. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, and abominable, and murderers, and immortal persons, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, their part will be the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Groaning. That's, that's groaning for all eternity. So will you groan for eternity, or do you have the hope and the assurance of eternity, eternal life with Christ? Speak to John. Speak to myself. Settle that before it's too late. So a final and complete freedom from sin and defilement of sin awaits us until then. Creation groans. True believers groan. The Holy Spirit groans from the defilement of sin. The challenge, though. The challenge for life. Am I groaning and hunger and thirsting for the right things and in the right way? Two more verses just to read, then the quote for the week, and then one more verse, okay? John chapter 4. Verses uh, 13 and 14, Jesus with the woman at the well of Samaria. Jesus said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Regular water. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst again. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And in John 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never grow hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. And the quote from the week, for the week, is from um, Thomas Watson. God will fill the hungry because he himself has stirred up that hunger. Wow. In Revelation 22, 17, the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears says, say, come. Whoever is thirsty, thirsty for God. That's not in the text, that's me. Whoever is thirsty for God. Unsaved person, thirsty for God, come. Saved person, thirsty for God, come. Let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free water, the free gift of the water of life. And just as we remembered at the Lord's table, he who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What's wrong with the world today? Why is there so much suffering, sin, defilement of sin, corruption of sin? Lord, help us, even in the midst of creation groaning, and even in the midst of sorrow and suffering and trials, help us, Lord, to know that you're with us with the Spirit, the fellowship of you, the fellowship of the church, the fellowship of the saints, to help us through these times. But help us, Lord, to really think about, examine ourselves. What, 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 do we groan over the defilement of sin 
and the corruption of sin in our life? Do we groan over it? Help us to groan over it like Paul did and then enter into the glory of Romans 8 and the victory that we can have ever increasingly through Christ. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, if there's any way anybody needs to speak with uh, Brother John or I or, or have prayer or words of encouragement, let's help us to take this seriously, Lord. Thank you for the deliverance from the power of sin, the, pre the, penalty, of, the penalty of sin, the power of sin over our lives now and one day from the presence of sin. Just a hunger and thirst, Lord, after righteousness. Put that into action. We pray in Jesus' name.